thank you so much um yeah thank you really appreciate uh the intro and thank you so much for having us and thank you everyone for joining uh i'm matt johnson i am a developer advocate with uh, bridge crew part of uh, palo alto and prisma cloud and yeah i am just super interested in kind of security and all things kubernetes and all things infrastructure as code so in this session we're going to kind of look at those coming together and kind of what the security landscape looks like when we have you know code we have infrastructure configurations um and you know how we need to kind of consider those as a single entity when we consider security posture so as i said i'm a developer advocate with bridge crew um i have been involved in containers since Solaris branded zones, which is probably showing my age at this point. Um, I'm a hobbyist t pen tester. I'm way better at the breaking stuff than the writing up the pen test reports afterwards. Um, but if you do want to kind of carry on this conversation, um, I've put the Palo Alto Twitter at the end, but I'm at MetaHertz on Twitter. Um, we also have a Slack channel for kind of all things infrastructure as code security at slack.bridgecrew.io. Um, so by all means, kind of find me there afterwards if you want to take any of these conversations offline. Um, also, the Q&A window, I can see in front of me here. Um, it's always more fun to kind of handle questions as they come in. So if you're interested in a specific thing, let's veer wildly off topic. Um, if you want to fire a Q&A over and I will try and get to them uh, as we go through. So with that said, I'm going to set some context and jump right in. And for this context, we're going to start in the persona of a developer. As we're going to see, there's a few different personas for um, security, obviously, in the software development lifecycle. Um, but let's start as the persona of a developer. I, as a developer, have access to a Kubernetes cluster. And in writing this talk based on, on the research I'm going to show, I was going to make a joke that a children's illustrated version of this is coming soon because it sounds like it could be a children's book and then i realized that actually that already exists um yeah it's called an illustrated children's guide to kubernetes and the cncf already wrote it so you know if you have kids and you really want them to understand the difference between a pod and a deployment that book is for you um but anyway the story of um a developer that has access to a kubernetes cluster and needs to deploy um some service that the business needs now are we going to expect that developer to go and write the deployment manifest themselves um or realistically you know their function is building that code base their function is and let's say that code base is running on top of nginx for example and using whatever modules nginx has built in to allow that code base to run really easily um are they going to want to build a nginx deployment themselves or are they just want to going to want to package the code that actually adds business value and deploy that onto an existing um, nginx deployment that they can push to their cluster so realistically they're probably going to go to their favorite search engine and they're going to look for an nginx uh, deployment and so that will probably bring them to he says if his mouse was working for changing slides that will probably bring them to here we go to he says small demo god demons always always especially at this time of the evening um this is probably if they are looking for um a pre-packaged kubernetes engine nginx, nginx deployment in kind of the Linux and kind of modern cloud native uh, CNCF landscape, it's probably going to bring them to somewhere like artifacthub.io, which is a repository of kind of everyone saying, hey, yeah, I have usable uh, Helm charts, I have usable packages for that kind of ecosystem. And so we find a Helm chart, we find an Nginx Helm chart, um, and we have some options here as a developer. We can either download and run it, um we can run for the door or we can go no i'm gonna spend the time and effort building one myself from scratch when one already exists um and as we all know the chances are um 
we're just going to download and run and see if in a demo environment that solves our needs and chances are it will. So we have Nginx um, and we can now proceed to deploy that on our cluster and do whatever we need to do with it to, to add business value. And we previously um, wrote a few blog posts on actually looking at the kind of default security posture of um, Helm charts available publicly, not necessarily just on Artifact Hub, um, also from sources on GitHub. And we scanned um, thousands of, uh, re well, hundreds of Helm repos containing thousands of Helm charts um, and wrote this up in a three part uh, blog series uh, about kind of the default posture. And what we found is you are more likely um, to download from a misconfigured Helm repo. Um, and within there, you are 46% likely to have a kind of misconfigured Helm chart by default if you take the defaults within that Helm chart. Um, what do we mean by misconfigured? Well, we mean um, it, won't, it won't by default um, hold up to kind of the security posture and the kind of good security practices you would expect for a productionized um, Kubernetes deployment, the resulting Kubernetes templates just, just won't be there. And it's something we expect and see in the industry because if you're trying to get a simple working example of Nginx that's easy to explain and easy to understand, you're not going to want your documentation to be pages and pages long um, explaining all the nuances of a hundred different Kubernetes options. Um, you know, it's that security versus usability and always in our industry usability seems to win. So it's not unsurprising that most default Helm charts um, are insecure by default. So to do this research, we took our open source scanning tool, Hel uh, Chekhov, which I'll, I'll demonstrate in a mo, and we went and found as many Helm charts as we could, parsed them out into their resultant Kubernetes configuration, and uh, process that data. And as you can see, um, we have a load of built-in Kubernetes policies and there were some quite shocking results. So for example, belt and braces, like not not locking down the security context, um, not making sure that you cannot run with privilege escalation, um, you know, so many containers still running as root. Um, and then kind of some lesser critical things, but it's like, you know, 90, 80 percent uh, have no CPU limits, no CPU requests, no memory limits, no memory requests. Now apologize and by all means kind of skip this little section if you're not deep into kind of kubernetes manifests but these are all things that kubernetes relies on to know whether an application is out of control whether it's about to swallow up all the resources on that node whether it should be shut down and you should raise an error like if you don't have cpu and memory limits in your application configuration then that application is at real risk of going wrong and kind of swallowing your cluster's resources so maybe not a security issue but definitely an availability issue which is you know just as just as valid since you know dos's usually get a cvss score um and i'm not trying to bash helm or kubernetes at all here uh, as i said this is a security versus usability problem and we did the same set of analysis and found roughly the same percentage um, across Terraform, uh, another infrastructure as code framework that some of you may be familiar with. And yeah, 44% chance you are likely to get a um, Terraform module from a public source that uh, doesn't meet uh, you know, today's expected security posture. And the reason is very, very simple. The reason is in a single slide, this, um, and we'll post these links so you don't have to copy them from memory um, into the chat. Um, but we created a um, both a blog post follow-up and as I said, the three-point Helm research where we actually go into this. This is a valid piece of Kubernetes. Um, this will happily run um, a demo application from my colleague Steve's uh, podcast, actually, where he kind of goes through a load of uh, Kubernetes security news, um, and it will happily deploy, uh, you know, a single replica of a single application. And that is valid Kubernetes, and you can throw that at a Kubernetes cluster, and it will run whatever we're suggesting to run as a container image. However, if you actually want to pass um, 
the Kubernetes CIS 1.6 security benchmarks, your Kubernetes manifest that does exactly the same thing for the end user, as in the application is running on your Kubernetes cluster, um, actually needs to look like this. It needs to be, it doesn't fit on the page levels of Kubernetes. And obviously the problem with that is most people working on code bases, most people working towards their company's missions and their features um, don't have a deep passion for all the options in Kubernetes. They are not security engineers first. They do not have the luxury of kind of sitting there and considering all these options. They're trying to get a job done. And so, you know, if Runzish Kubernetes works, that's generally what you're going to find in kind of public Helm charts and in, hey, this works for me, try it out. Um, kind of community environments. And so we have a lot of usable public charts and a lot of usable public charts are probably going to be this kind of size. How do we know as an engineer um, what we are missing? How do we know whether that's secure or not? And how do we get to kind of this? And preferably, how do we get to this larger, more secure Kubernetes without... Um, without writing it all ourselves specifically. And so, um, as I said, I'm gonna introduce what we use to generate this data set. Um, we have an open source uh, infrastructure as code scanner called Chekhov, Chekhov.io. Um, and it comes with, unlike kind of having to have policy packs, it comes with over a thousand checks built in across all the cloud providers, Terraform, CloudFormation, Kubernetes, Helm. Uh, we're just adding customized support today. Uh, the PO is ready to be merged. Um, uh, serverless framework, you know, uh, on templates for Azure, you name it. Um, Chekhov is designed to find misconfigurations in your infrastructure as code and help you go, hey, that's probably not something you want from as simple as um, that S3 bucket's got public rights on it in Amazon all the way to you need to minimize access of root containers in your, in your Kubernetes uh, pods and clusters. So um, it's designed to be used in CI. It's not designed to give developers any extra headaches or any extra work. Um, and so, yeah, we have a, a GitHub action, for example, that you can just drop in if GitHub actions are your things. Um, and like any other good tool, it does one thing. It does it pretty well, I'd say. Um, and it will obviously return a bad exit code. So you can pretty much put it in any of your um, CI CD environments. So when you are starting your journey for more secure um, deployments and you realize that infrastructure misconfigurations still play a massive part of that um, as we've just seen with the kubernetes example you're going to run into two problems problem one is where to start as developers we are already very familiar with cves and security vulnerabilities within libraries that our code depends on or within our code itself um, as you see on the right of this slide. So, uh, for example, a quick uh, scan of the Nextcloud um, Apache Docker container highlights seven critical, 34 uh, high, 406 vulnerabilities in total across a load of different packages. You know, developers are very familiar with thousands of CVEs that they are expected to deal with and patch and maintain. And what you're going to find when it comes to um, infrastructure as code, which realistically, if you're using Kubernetes, you already have an infrastructure as code usage. You can't ignore it. Um, what you're going to find when you run Chekhov against your Kubernetes, much like the small versus big Kubernetes example, is added to those CVEs, you are also going to have a load of misconfigurations that aren't security compliant with your infrastructure as code. Uh, like I said, memory limits not being set. Uh, image pull policy should be always to stop someone poisoning um, a local node's uh, image cache. Um, don't mount secrets as environment variables because some error pages dump environment variables. You know, all very sensible CIS benchmarks marks uh, for um, the common good of, of creating a more secure environment. But to a developer, that just adds more complexity. That's more things they need to do that aren't necessarily kind of quote unquote getting their job done. And security is everyone's job, but if you've worked in any real world environment, you, you know what I mean by that. And so that's problem one, and I'm going to focus on that mainly. Problem two is security isn't a point of time. We can't just fix all those issues 
once locally and then push and we're done and we never have to look at that code base again because Docker images change, new CVEs come up, like entropy guarantees that something left on its own um, will go bad in software engineering, even if it was good at point of release. And so because of that kind of the bridge crew in the Palo Alto kind of mindset on this for uh, kind of DevSecOps and, and looking at secure deployment pipelines is you need to run the same policies from kind of day zero all the way to day X. You should be checking the policies at the IDE level, at the PI level, through CICD with Chekhov, and then also checking those same policies against the items created in runtime uh, to make sure you don't have drift, to make sure there, you know, someone hasn't gone in and manually changed something, to make sure that an image that was secure is now not vulnerable because of a new CVE. Unless you have that kind of complete circle um, that matches your development lifecycle, you're gonna miss something. Um, so that's problem two. But problem one is the thing that most people get caught up with the first because you're introducing developers to screens like this, which basically are just lines saying more work, more work, lots more work. And so problem one is quite hard to solve. And we recently had the opportunity to work with the wonderful friendly hackers um, in the Unit 42 uh, cloud threat and security um, research team. And we actually shared some of our kind of helm scanning data um, that they kind of went and did really cool things with to build uh, the cloud threat report that came out um, at the end of 2021. And it was amazing to kind of work with them to see that what we thought was kind of interesting with, um, you know, all these infrastructure misconfigurations and then you know how that can affect supply chain and how that kind of ties into cves and it just kind of highlighted how wide a problem this is when you've just got all these cves all these issues um and and what do you do to kind of get through that noise because realistically if every project is giving a developer that much noise um it's probably not going to get fixed or it's definitely not going to get fixed in the areas that need the most attention the, the quickest because it'll just be sat on a backlog and who knows if you're actually getting the priority items. And so this this got us thinking um, at Bridge Crew about the concept of, well, what does matter? You know, yes, every, every vulnerability is bad, sure, and every misconfiguration is bad, but there is, there is definitions of badness um, and this got us thinking of this concept of blast radius. So I will give you an example. If I have a load balancer that allows anyone in from any IP on the IPv4 internet, so anyone on the internet can get to this load balancer, is that a misconfiguration? Yes, probably. We probably didn't mean to do that. However, the load balancer has no backend service attached to it, so the traffic gets dropped on the floor. It, it cannot attack a service because there is no service. Yes, there is a misconfigured load balancer. We would say that's an infrastructure misconfiguration. You probably don't want something allowing all ports in from the whole internet. But if, it's, if there's no attack chain, if there's nothing going on there, I wouldn't necessarily prioritize a developer fixing that issue first because the, the risk of an attack chain leading to compromise there is negligible uh, you know arguably yes there could be some internal hair pinning of the load balancer at kind of other potentially far-fetched scenarios but in its default configuration that's not a massive priority but it is a misconfiguration whereas you take something um like this you take um a misconfiguration first approach where we have the same open load balancer security group but that load balancer has ports open um that are not meant to be open and there is something behind the load balancer there is this container and this container may have an application that is meant to be exposed publicly via the load balancer but it's also exposing a monitoring endpoint on a different port that isn't meant to be exposed and because that monitoring endpoint is internal um, it or it's meant to be internal, it might not have authentication, it might be running an old unpatched um, 
web browser within that code base because it's not public so quote unquote who cares and so because of that infrastructure misconfiguration we're suddenly now in a scenario where we have access to potentially a cve within that monitoring endpoint that gives us access to that container so that's how a misconfiguration can lead to something which otherwise might have you know successfully been a cve that never got attacked for years and years because there was no access to that cve from a, an attacker's kind of attack chain um, and then once we have container access again misconfigurations that could easily be ignored in the list of output for kubernetes misconfigurations might mean that there's still a default service account in kubernetes mapped to that pod which means we have some form of kubernetes api credentials that the attacker from inside the cluster can then use to query the kubernetes api and potentially find lateral movement into other parts of the infrastructure into other kubernetes workloads um, look at what else is happening in that namespace etc etc you know equally the other way around let's say we have a public um let's say we have a public website that is running log4j for example an unpatched version so the cve is the first thing an attacker can get to the website has to be public because the website is meant to be public that's the whole point of it um but because of that cve um that yeah that cve would normally get us into just that pod and if we're very careful we can do things with that pod but if we crash that pod you know we get a new one and we have to start all over again but if we compare that cve with misconfigurations that have been ignored in the infrastructure we might have again a default service account in that pod which allows us to query the kubernetes api lateral movement into the infrastructure or alternatively we might have misconfigured network policies um, within our kubernetes um, network policy objects or even within our wider um, cloud service provider that allow us to use that as a hopping off point um, to download some tools and uh, hairpin into other infrastructure, probe other ports, probe for kind of internal services um, that let us, again, lateral move into other parts of the infrastructure. So whether it's CVE first or whether it's um, infrastructure misconfiguration first, do not rule out one being more important than the other like attackers will never do a single thing and go yep hack done like it's a it's a chain it's a, a game of chess and what we're finding is infrastructure misconfigurations are just as common if not more so as the kind of first uh, stepping off point to a successful breach and so that's all well and good but how do you get diagrams like that when you are looking at data like this was our next point like this is this is not useful um this is not useful at all um especially as i said if your developers aren't necessarily uh full-time security advocates um they are they're trying to get a job done like how do we make this easier how do we make the flow something more like this so we took the data we'd already generated and we created like a little bit of like a hacky beta visualization um, and we've put it online here um, at uh, bridge cryo github uh, helm scanner and what this is is basically a point in time snapshot of every helm chart in artifacthub.io and what we're trying to highlight is the, the the kind of likeliness of an attack chain by mapping all of the misconfiguration items from the Kubernetes, the infrastructure uh, configuration, through to the containers that are used within that infrastructure configuration, through to the CVEs we have found within that container. And powered by um, Palo Alto's uh, image scanning capabilities that are now built back into Chekhov, um, and powered by Chekhov's infrastructure scanning capabilities, um, we can do all of this in one tool, and then we're effectively spitting out um, these dynamic graphs for each. So if I quickly go to that page, so bridgecryo.github.io slash helmscanner, you can see we have a bit of information here, and then what we have is a searchable list of um, every uh, Helm chart we found, and the search does work. So you can go here, you can search for a single CVE, you can search for a specific infrastructure check in Chekhov, um, 
uh, or you can search for the Helm chart itself. And then for each, we can see the list of CVEs and infrastructure issues. But if we click on the blast radius graph for this, we can then kind of start zooming in and really understand whether this is somewhere we should be um, focusing our time or not, or whether, you know, maybe we have other issues. So first of all, yes, this Docker container, um, quite a lot of CVEs. You can hover over them to see uh, the CVE, the, the name. We are only showing, by the way, in this whole website, um, CVSS scores above five. So if you have something like this, it's it's probably a, a good example of um, a very insecure container image. Um, but we can see that this is coming from um, this Helm chart. It's only got one deployment called de the default deployment, which is a Helm resource. And we can see that this um, has numerous um, infrastructure misconfigurations provided by Chekhov. So here, uh, it's not using a read-only file system. There's no liveness probe. Uh, root containers are not intrinsically banned. Um, it's not using a SHA tag. So it's using uh, either latest or blank, um, which means it'd be very easy potentially to do upstream attacks on that container uh, and run on people's infrastructures. And the idea behind these is it helps us have conversations around prioritization. It's not perfect. Uh, we did it just to kind of, you know, highlight these issues to uh, you guys and girls, the wider audience. Um, but it gives you something to play with to kind of start modeling how important it is to not just consider CVEs, not just consider misconfigurations uh, in your infrastructure. So if your infrastructure team that does your Kubernetes deployments is still completely separate to your teams that deal with your code and think about words like CVE. Um, hopefully this diagram explains why, you know, those teams need to start working together to look at prioritization of threats. And so this puts us in a scenario where, you know, we can start going, well, okay, um, I can see that in this particular Helm chart, um, I have an issue, a quite a serious issue where I have roles and cluster roles defined that are using wildcards. So if someone got the hands on the credentials for the roles I'm creating there, who knows what they could have access to. Generally speaking, if you find stars in anything, be it IAM or uh, security configurations, it's a bad, bad thing. So, okay, um, that's something I should probably look at. Um, but could anyone use that? Um, is there an attack chain? Uh, going back to kind of if someone popped our container with a CVE, um, is there a way of getting anywhere else into our infrastructure? Because, you know, if they just stick in the pod, that's a pretty good day for an attack. If they manage to end up in our Kubernetes cluster, that's that's not so great. And so we, we've seen that they have wildcards, but we've also seen that the deployment that's, you know, within the same Helm chart, these roles are set up for this deployment, but this deployment export service account tokens mounted into the containers. So whatever we were giving wildcard access to um, will be available in that pod um, if someone, you know, gained gained kind of control over that pod. So that's not necessarily a good thing. And kind of, you know, you could then go, well, okay, um, let's go back and look at the CSVs within this, con the containers within this Helm chart. What are the chances we have any kind of remote access CVEs that could get to these misconfigurations in the first place? And it just allows you to have a much more kind of combined conversation about security posture and prioritization. And by the way, this isn't the end of the research and, you know, what we're planning to build into the product here. It's just kind of a really nice way of visualizing how important it is to treat these two things as, um, you know, the same when it comes to security posture. And then for kind of people that are dealing with this every day, again, still very much on the developer persona, uh, but a lot of this is you just have to have the context of the people deploying to Kubernetes, the people writing code that is going to end up in, in these environments, be it Kubernetes, be it Terraform. Um, other considerations specifically around Helm, um, you know, a lot of images we scanned, you know, for CVEs don't just have CVEs, they also have tools that don't really need to be there. Um, they're tools that are useful for developers, but not useful for running production code. So it's amazing how many containers you have running in your production workloads will have 
uh, web browsers like curl installed and tools like NS Enter, which allows you to try and break out of, um, you know, Linux C group namespaces. Um, you might have Sue installed that allows you to, you know, try bashing against um, root accounts. You know, Sue is a usually a, a chmod uh, root binary, probably something you don't want on your image. Um, so all these tools, not necessary. They give a hacker extra options, um, like downloading files really easily with curl. Um, if they do manage to get themselves into a pod, uh, they do manage to get a shell on that pod. Um, so with those tools, that image is easily equipped to enumerate the network with curl, uh, serve malicious content. Um, you can abuse our back uh, with NS enter um, and potentially uh, allow for breakout to the host. Um, you know, whereas if you are making it hard, um, if we're, if you're making it harder without having those tools, you know, it's defense in depth and it's just something else to look out for while we're talking about security considerations. Um, as I said, problem two, and we'll come back to this now is this, um, security isn't a point in time. Um, we've got a question by the way on the Q and a. Um, I'll answer it live. Uh, is Chekhov similar to what one can achieve with Cubescape? Um, not being intimately familiar with Cubescape, um, if it is kind of a policy engine that kind of looks through um, your Kubernetes configuration and goes, hey, yeah, um, that's that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. Um, you know, you probably need to tweak this deployment to secure this or to not run root containers. Um, yes, if if it's kind of rules engine based, then then Chekhov does the same kind of thing. We have a load of built-in rules, um, but Chekhov's also multi-infrastructure as code. So it doesn't just do Kubernetes, as I said. It does um, Kubernetes. It parses Helm charts automatically. It does customize as of this PR um, things like that. Um, so the Helm scanner data second question as well. Um, and by all means, uh, anonymous attendee on the Cubescape thing, if you want to reach out to me on Twitter afterwards, um, I'll have a look and, and give you a, a much more in-depth answer. Um, Karen, um, thanks for the question. How will the Helm scanner database be updated? Um, at the moment, it isn't. At the moment, it's a point of time um, just because we were hitting the artifact hub uh, API is pretty hard to download all of the Helm data. It does run and generate a new set of data, so we might turn that on as a GitHub Action CICD job in future. Um, if that's an interesting use case for you, if you know API access to that kind of data is interesting, again, um, love to have that conversation. Building use cases on this, finding other people kind of interested in kind of similar research. So uh, yeah, definitely reach out. Um, so yeah, problem two, kind of security isn't point in time. Um, this is, you know, more of a solved problem, which is why I wanted to kind of touch on kind of the new research around Blast Radius. Um, Bridge Crew, part of Palo Alto, is literally a one-stop shop to solve this problem, uh, regardless of whether you're using Kubernetes um, or other kinds of infrastructure as code, like Terraform, CloudFormation, you name it. Um, and the way we deal with this is we basically offer a platform which applies the same checkoff policies effectively, but at every single stage of this um, this diagram automatically. So um, within Bridge Crew, you can integrate it with your source control, be it GitHub or any of the integrations you see there. You can integrate it with cloud providers to get um, real-time runtime information. Um, and then you can also integrate through Chekhov or other CICD plugins uh, like GitHub Actions um, to make sure we can see not only the code at rest, we can see whether that code has gone through CICD on its way to production or been blocked or not because of violations. But then we can also see the resulting uh, objects that have been created in your cloud environment and we can tie those cloud environment objects back to what has been deployed through CICD and where that lies in um, your code base, which allows us to do some really cool things. So we can automate fixes um, to basically give you like a virtual security advocate uh, by scanning pull requests as they come into your team. Um, and once they're there, we can go, hey, actually, um, we know that you need to fix this piece of Terraform and this Kubernetes manifest. Here is how you would do that. Here are the issues with that manifest. Again, just kind of providing some context and providing a developer that maybe 
isn't uh, particularly security savvy or um, you know doesn't have particular contextual knowledge of the security configuration of that project that there is something in this PR which they should probably send for further review uh, that could affect security um, here you can see more of that PR where we are actively saying yep here are some issues um, and in some cases adding um, pull request data to actually remediate those and go hey yeah do you know what that's a boolean flag like versioning is either on or off for a, a s3 bucket for example so bridge crew allows you to uh, will suggest those kind of fixes uh, and allow you to raise prs back into your organization um, to kind of zero touch fix those issues and then because we are tracking um, runtime and the original resources in git we know the format that you wanted them to be in. So we can also, and again, this is why it's important to do everything across that diagram. Um, we can also do automated drift detection. So you can see here, this is a live AWS environment. And what we're saying is um, this piece of infrastructure as code defined that the ACO should be private um, for whatever reason, be it uh, indication of compromise, be it someone logging into the cloud environment manually um, to, to fix a bug or to, to do something um, you know, we can see that that private is now missing from the runtime resource, like something has changed, something has drifted, um, and we can alert on that uh, as well, which obviously if you were only scanning your CI CD pipeline and just assuming once it's in production, it's fine, uh, you'd miss that. A um, couple more questions while we have time. Um, so um, the sue curl ns enter um, someone was asking what do those mean um, so these are um, common linux commands that developers will use on their kind of desktops and on their servers um, to do various things so for example curl allows you to retrieve um, downloads from uh, a web browser a web server so just like chrome but on the command line effectively um, However, having these in your containers where you are running your production code base, there's no need for them. Um, so any Docker containers that kind of have these kind of tools, um, you're, you're just exposing unnecessary tools that an attacker could potentially take use of. Um, not a security vulnerability in themselves, not hacking tools by any means, but again, just things to watch out for, uh, minimizing that kind of uh, attack surface and then Richard asks uh, from a Kate aspect any advantage security wise using customize uh, over helm or even Pulumi? Um good question so hang on let me break that down into a couple um, no real security advantage because chances are you're not going to find like if you go and find a random snippet of kubernetes online it will, from my personal experience, be just as vulnerable as the uh, available Helm and the available customized charts. And that's purely because they're not trying to be vulnerable. Um, it's that security versus usability issue. Um, it works and it's simple to understand and therefore people will use it because it's simple to understand. So it gets upvoted and it gets reused and it gets reshared. Um, so no, effectively all customize and Helm do is template out to uh, Kubernetes manifest anyway. So in terms of security posture, they're all much of a muchness. I'd say customize and Helm charts are more secure and hear me out here because they're in a format that is designed to be shared. Um, it means that, you know, teams like myself, at, uh, Palo Alto, it means that, you know, security researchers are more likely to target submitting pull requests and fixing security posture issues or reviewing the security posture of something that is, we can tell from Artifact Hub has been downloaded millions of times uh, because it's designed to be reused rather than just a random snippet of, um, ter of, of Kubernetes or Terraform in a GitHub gist, which, you know, is just someone's manifest that isn't really designed to be reused so um, reuse is definitely good and hopefully it gets more people looking at those uh, items so yeah uh, over time with kind of these issues more and more highlighted uh, hopefully Helm and Customize will end up with a, a much better security posture and then um, I'll get to Yuri's question in a mo um, I just want to get through the um, 
little bits of advice we have here. So yeah, definitely check out bridgecrew.cloud um, and our blog at bridgecrew.io slash blog for information on kind of question two, um, because we do literally live and breathe dealing with end-to-end -end infrastructure as code scanning um, and, and looking at how we can tie blast radius um, into everything I've just showed you in those screenshots as well. It's a free trial, go check it out. It's actually really awesome. Um, a bit of advice um, I wanted to give now, and again, I'm going to split this into two personas because everything we've kind of looked at is kind of deep dived on the coal face, like people writing code and, um, you know, people deploying Kubernetes manifests. And I hope you appreciate from the nuance of what we've been talking about, they are the people you need involved in, this con in these con security con conversations because that's where all the context is that's where whether things are or aren't accessible or need to be accessible or whether that does or doesn't pose a security risk gone are the days where you can run a single security scanning tool against a vm and go yep that's fine uh, and that can be a separate team so from a practitioner's point of view um like i said we have uh, a lot of blog posts where we are focusing on um taking an insecure Kubernetes manifest and looking at what we actually need to do step by step um, and w what each line that we're adding does and why we're adding it and context around that. So uh, my colleague Steve was responsible for the large Nginx uh, manifest that was secure and he goes through that in a blog post and step by step shows why each of those are there. And equally, I've done the same um, for a vulnerable Helm chart where I go through and make uh, modifications to that Helm chart to make it secure in terms of all the kind of Kubernetes checkoff policies. And then um, finally, if you are in a, oh my God, I've got thousands of infrastructure as code issues, um, we also have a baseline feature which allows you to run checkoff in CI and only block on new issues rather than issues that were there when you first ran. Um, that's a really good way of kind of, you know, freeing up your developers to um, make you know know that there's no new issues being introduced by new code and new infrastructure uh, and kind of stops that technical debt getting bigger and allows you to then go back and prioritize and kind of look at blast radius and, and work out which of the existing issues you need to deal with uh, and again um, give bridge crew a try it is definitely your ally for uh, automating a lot of this if you don't fancy kind of rolling your own with Chekhov and, and other tools and then to enablers, to um, you know, C-suite managers, kind of anyone not doing the actual manifest and not doing the actual code. Um, my advice would be, uh, first of all, security isn't no. Um, so you know, there needs to be that security has to have a security has to have a share of resource within any um, within any team within any development work. Um, and it's not going to be solved by one big push, one big sprint. Hey, let's just let's just spend this sprint getting all the security issues done because, as I said, entropy will guarantee that that will never work. Um, little and often, you know, allowing uh, through prioritization, through kind of looking at the the Chekhov um, baselining mode, um, allowing a little bit of time more often um, to kind of you know chip away at high priority issues. Um, is is definitely a more sustainable kind of way to deal with that um try and embrace passion where you can you might find that you know there are people that have kind of that enjoy this nuance that talk about security issues on your team more than other developers that have kind of that hacker spirit that that are almost already seen as like a security advocate within a dev team or an ops team um you know nurture that use that give maybe eke them out a bit of time um to kind of start thinking about a strategy for dealing with this um Chekhov and bridge crew are going to let you know what you didn't already know and you know having that person be able to come to you with a prioritized list of issues is um you know a massive part of the challenge once you once you turn your unknown unknowns into kind of knowns then you can start prioritizing what you want to do about them um and there is a lot you can do um in a small amount of time to, as I said, use use Chekhov, use tools to at least understand your posture, but even just ha getting low hanging fruits, even just making sure you've not got kind of 
keys or you're not exposing Kubernetes uh, tokens where you don't need to or making sure you don't have any wide open load balancers or you know all that kind of good stuff. Um, there's a lot you can do in a small amount of time. It just requires a bit of work to kind of prioritize and understand your posture. Um, and then yeah, finally, here is my slide on takeaways. Um, the one I'm gonna highlight is the more you automate bridge crew, check off CI, um, for every hour spent automating is going to free up potentially an hour once a week, once a month, once a day, once a once, you know, whatever for one of your devs. And that next hour they've saved next week can be used to automate a bit more and a bit more. Um, it will feel like work. The defaults are not secure. You will start digging your way through thousands of issues if you already have a reasonably large code base. Um, but misconfigurations are just as likely to expose you to compromise as CVEs, especially when used together. So, um, yeah, take this stuff seriously. I know everyone does, um, but it will feel like work. But, um, yeah, small steps. And hopefully this was really insightful for some of you. Um, I'm going to quickly, if we have time, I think I've got like 30 seconds. Um, is it possible to run Chekhov uh, tool already running on-prem bare metal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Chekhov will happily run uh, against your uh, Kubernetes um, manifest. So if you have them in a repo before you've deployed them, um, we are also in the process. There's a, a PR for it open right now uh, in the Chekhov um, repo. We're in the middle of building an admission controller, which would then run a subset of the Chekhov policies when you try and deploy or update something in Kubernetes. Um, so you know immediately uh, without having to have a CI pipeline or anything like that on some of the more uh, critical issues. Uh, Chekhov is completely open source, Chekhov.io. Um, let me find you how to spell that. There you go, C-H-E-C-K-O-V.io. Um, we love suggestions, pull requests, contributions. Um, yeah, it is fully open source and we have a massive community at um, slack.bridgecrew.io because uh, Bridgecrew are the authors and still sponsor and, and maintain its development to this day. So come and join us, say hi, and uh, hopefully I've got to everyone's question. And yeah, thank you so much for listening. Hope, uh, hope this has been useful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, this recording will be up on our YouTube uh, by end of day today, and we hope to see you back for a future webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.